Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 24, 2020. This is the week and charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Looks like our nightly numbers are going up more and more. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now. A lot of trash television on. Uh, the I did not update this screen. So the basics is we're going to talk about current market conditions, your question on trading your favorite stock picks. And this week I'm going to focus on solving your trading problems and also want to take a look at a couple of questions that I've got over the week and flesh those out a little bit. And that'll all make a lot more sense. This is playing the screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. The one thing I neglected to mention was when we get to the live, wait till we get to the live charts before asking about stocks. And then once we're there, just ask about one stock at a time. Also, if you don't mind, keep your questions relative to the slides. And once we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything. That's just so my ADD doesn't kick in. So first off, we got a question just a few minutes ago or a few hours ago. Dave, you keep requesting questions, so here we go. Well, it is more of an observation. This is not, so far at least, a deep drop, as deep a drop as February, March, but it keeps some longer the amount of stocks in an uptrend, proper water plus 10 days light, even for 10 SMA, seems to be reduced, so we might sit on our hands for a while if not shorting, do you combine any strategy or is this the price of trend following? Thanks, Avi. Well, Avi must not be, I'm guessing he's not in a trading service because the trading service will bring you up to speed on my thinking and where we are. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through a lot of that in just one minute. If you can't sleep at night, dayleonard.com slash archives, you can go in and watch the archives going back many years. You can see warts and all what I was thinking at the time I was thinking. And we'll do a little bit of that tonight. One thing that he said, even on the 10 day simple moving average with the Landry light. Now, I just wanna show you something. If you're using something like a 10 day simple, and right here is a 10 day simple moving average and a 30 day exponential. 30 day exponential, if you've been coming to these shows recently, is something I've been playing with a lot lately. It's something I really, like and it works really well with the Landry light which is down here and in case you're watching on YouTube and you're not up to speed on all this green just simply means the lows or above the moving average there's light so to speak between the low and the moving average and red means that the highs are below the moving average there's light so to speak below the moving average now the great thing about using the Landry light is if you sit around and wait for a crossing, that might take a while to happen. But with Landry Light, it takes some of the lag out when you get a signal because moving because the price could just cross above the moving average really quick, and you're not waiting for that moving average to catch up or cross over or whatever the case may be. And that's a cool thing about that. So if you're using a shorter term moving average like the 10 we have plotted here. And this is a 10 day simple in this case. And then down here is a 30 day exponential. And it just illustrates the amount of Landry light. You could see that this indicator turned positive from red to green way back in late March. Whereas it took a little bit longer for the 30 day Landry light. In other words, the low to be greater than that. 30 day Landry light. It took a little while for that, hap that to happen. Actually, about two more days from where I have this line drawn, you can see it was just beginning to get up there and cross over. Now, here's the other thing though. Here's the trade off. It's going to be harder to sustain if you're using a shorter term moving average. So you can see in the top chart, it tends to cross back and forth, where the whereas in the bottom chart with the 30, it tends to stay green for a lot longer, not as much sawtooth and not as much whipsaw, so to speak. So just by accident, we kind of backed into something here, kind of unpacking his question. And that is, if you're using a short-term moving average with Landry light, that's going to be harder to sustain, and you're going to get a lot more signals. Now, that might not be a bad thing. One thing that you might could do 
just kind of thinking out loud is maybe say, okay, well, we've got a longer term trend in the green down here with the 30 day EMA. Maybe let's wait and see if we get a little pullback in a shorter term moving average or some Landry life and a downside in a shorter term moving average, and then look to get long. Again, kind of the same deal we're doing where we look to get long after we pull back the 30 EMA like we did back here, which the signal would have been here, and then a shorter term signal back here. Maybe look for some sort of downside Landry light to help illustrate that the market has pulled back. So look for Landry light at a shorter term as long as you have a much, much, much longer term Landry light on the longer term chart using something like a 30 day EMA. Now, I thought it would be cool to show you what it would look like on a five day simple with the Landry light and a, again, comparing it to a 30 day exponential. And you can see a 30 day exponential makes a little bit of a sawtooth, but it never does go red. And also, as we've been discussing quite a bit, this is a Landry light pullback. You wait for that Landry light to occur at least 10 days or more. And then you wait for a pullback to the EMA. Then you look to get long. Okay. Last signal would have been pretty good. It never did come back below that pullback. Yeah, it took a little while to get gone, but you never did have negative Landry light. But you can see if you're watching something like the five day simple moving average, you're going to get a lot noisier signal. But the cool thing is, it's like, okay, well, wait a minute. This thing's starting to turn red up here. Oh, it's red for two or three days. We could be in trouble. Well, in this particular case, the market dropped so fast, the 30 caught up with it pretty quickly. But it did have a couple of days of red before it turned green back here. So just something to throw out, something to kind of play with. That's the beauty of, of teaching. Once again, when I start answering these questions, a lot of times I'm able to flesh out a lot of things that I've discovered over the years, such as the fact that you would have the, the noisier signals with a shorter term moving average, you would think you would be it would be a little bit different, but it's actually just the opposite of what you might initially think. And the other thing is in, in showing you these things, I pick up on a lot of stuff too. So anyway, let me just shift gears. So one of the things he said, is that the price of trend following? And the answer is yes. The price of trend following is you're going to be mostly long at tops and mostly short at bottoms. So this is a slide that I did for my Trading Simplified show mid-year update where they wanted me to go in and talk about lessons of the year and what I saw up to the middle of the year and what, what, I, what did I see looking ahead. And I talked about the fact that I was heavily long and then only had two shorts on at the peak of the market. Now, in some cases, and I know I've said this a thousand times, but in some cases, if a market makes a gradual rollover, you will actually, especially by paying attention to the database, looking at a couple thousand stocks a night like I do, you might actually see some short setting up early on. And like in, I know I've said this quite a bit, I'll keep saying it probably as it comes up, but back in 2007, I think it was October or so, and in prior shows, you can go back in and look, some weekly charts, that is, You'll see that I talked about the fact that I apologized to my clients, even though the market was making new highs, because I couldn't find any new longs, and all I could produce was shorts. Well, I had no idea the market was getting ready to roll over. And even in this last little peak, you can see we had two shorts right at the peak. The perverse thing is when the market first began to crack, we actually got stopped out of one of those shorts, which would have paid off big. But, you know, it happens, fell with a silent SH. But you can see as the market continued to drop, we became less and less long. In other words, we got stopped out of those longs and we became more and more short. And as the market bottomed, we became less and less short and more and more longs until we were all longs and no shorts. Now, what's kind of cool is if you plot a graph on top of this, and you use plus one for longs like I use in the spreadsheet, and you use minus one for shorts, then you will get 
a graph that shows you how long you are and how short you are. So obviously, this is the zero line here. Anything below the zero line means you are fully short, and anything above the zero line means you are mostly long, okay? So negative is down here, okay? Negative being all, all shorts, plus one, minus one. And then as you start adding on longs, net, net, okay? Take the number of longs minus the number of shorts, okay? And as you'll see in the spreadsheet, it'll make a little more sense. But you can see the net, net number goes above the zero line. now. And putting this together when I did this over the summer for stockcharts.com, I noticed, and it wasn't a big shocker to me, but it's kind of cool that it illustrated how there's a shift. Notice that we were fully short way over here, okay? And the market was doing what? It was starting to go out. Well, that's okay because guess what? We trade pullbacks, and we didn't know that that pullback was going to be the mother of all bottoms, at least not at the time. So it's just kind of cool that it kind of illustrates that you're going to be a little late to the game as a trend follower. And so that's the question Avi was asking is, is that the price of trend following? And I'm going to go through a lot of examples of this in just one second. But to answer him, the answer is yes. And it's painful, and sometimes it actually sucks somewhat. I'm trying not to look at my equity curve too much lately because it's a little depressing because I'm giving up these open profits, and my shorts haven't really kicked it into gear just yet. Market's sliding a little bit, and it's a bit of a environment. You're probably thinking, well, Dave, why not just exit those longs if the market looks iffy? Well, if you did that every time the market looks iffy, you would never catch any longer-term gains. and Coming into today, we had like one of these stupid Spock stocks on the uh, recommended lists, and it didn't trigger. And the reason, even though the market's look a little iffy, and I decided to go with the Spock stock was because I figured that it could trade independently of the market, and it was set up in a good-looking setup. Also had a metal stock set up, and I thought it was worthwhile. Now, let's crank up the time machine, and again, www.davelandry.com slash archives, and go back and see what I was thinking just a few weeks ago when this market hit its peak. So here's the spreadsheet from that day, okay? This is the exact peak of the market, and you can see we were long seven stocks. One plus one means long, Minus one means short. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now remember, we divide each position into two loaves, but we actually put on all the shares at one time. And the reason we divide them up is just to show the money management in action and know whether or not we're profitable on the position overall. For instance, APG just so happened to be two points on a hypothetical $2,000 account. I do I do take all the trades I recommend, FYI. I get asked that a lot. Yes, I do. And a lot of times I'll actually show you the trades in these presentations, especially in the stock charts presentations, because people don't know me just yet. <laughs> Although they find it out pretty quick who I am. <laughs> Good and bad. Anyway, so you can see 500 shares. We taking partial profits on this. We're looking for 1% on the first loaf or $1,000 per 100K. In this case, down here, you can see we took off half the shares and it turned out to be $1,000. Now, before I digress too, too much talking about the spreadsheet, notice that I had one buy at the absolute peak of the market, and that was actually on there for a few days. You can see 9.1. This was published 9.3. The market peaked on, actually, this was published 9.3 or 9.4. I forget the day the market peaked. But anyway, this was published the exact day the market peaked after the close. And you could see where we're looking to possibly get long three setups, depending on how aggressive you were. The CELH and the CLSK were a little bit more riskier stocks than the ICLK, but that was pretty risky too. And if you look to the left, this is my Landry list. This is the watch list I publish every night. And there were just a plethora of longs. In fact, there were 21 longs in that list, as you can see. 
So every one of those stocks were potential longs. Actually, there were 24 total, and plus the three over here, so it's 24 longs altogether. So again, all of those were potential longs. Now, if we fast forward a day, what happened? We got knocked out of two positions, one for a profit overall, a scratch on the second half, that's our second half, that's our XT, and then one for around a 2% loss, okay? It happens. First guru ever to show you a losing trade, right? And you can see we still have a bunch of potential longs. Why? Well, so far the market is just pulling back. Just FYI, this date here is going to be the date of the actual trade recommendation, or the date where the trade recommendations would possibly trigger. In other words, 904, I would publish that on the night of 903, or if it's on a weekend, obviously the Friday before. So again, we keep fast forwarding one day at a time, and I skipped a day or two where there's not a whole lot of action that happened. But you can see we still have three longs left in the portfolio. We got knocked out of two. And then once again, we still have three potential longs for new setups, and they're all three potential buys. And once again, there are no shorts showing up from the database. So as far as I'm concerned, at this point in time, the market is just kind of pulling back. And it might just still be pulling back. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes. So now we still have three longs on, two potential new longs, and this is on 9, 8, 20, and all potential longs in the Landry list. Now, this date right here is wrong. This was actually published on 9, 9, so this should read 9, 10 up here. Look what happened, a dramatic shift in what the database is producing. We still have three longs, but now I have two potential shorts, and then look at the plethora of shorts over here that are setting up. So there's 14 potential shorts over here. Now we fast forward another day, and we still have three positions in the portfolio, two potential shorts, and a plethora of shorts. <laughs> that was in Germany. Dave, I learned a new word from you, plethora. <laughs> it's like, well, hopefully you learned something else, but uh, at least you learned something. <laughs> and on this particular point in time, we had four longs because the RXT had triggered. Now we keep going forward, four longs, one short is now in the portfolio, and then one potential short is in the portfolio, plus everything with a red check mark over here is a potential long. Notice there's, I'm sorry, potential short. Notice there's only a few longs relative to the number of shorts in here. And then this was a spreadsheet coming into today. We had stopped out that LAC last night, or night before last, I should say, or day before yesterday. And one, two, three, correction, yesterday, I think. One, two, three longs are left and one short. So three longs now left and one short. Now, you might be wondering with the, met, with the market looking a little questionable, why would I recommend longs? Well, I thought they were good looking setups. One was a metal, which was a textbook setup. And like I told my people last night, I even though metals were starting to look a little iffy too, or quite iffy, it was such a textbook setup that I think in a case like that, you have to take the setup. And before I digress too far, or let me just kind of get this thought out, a lot of the questions that people were asking me, problems to solve is on stock selection. Well, with stock selection, it takes a while to teach stock selection. There's a lot of little simple things I could show you that come out in these webinars like don't buy stocks a lot of overhead supply don't buy electric cardiogram look at stocks and so on and so forth but to get down to the nitty-gritty the nuances of it it took me 14 hours i think seven or eight hours of instruction followed by six or seven hours of ongoing sessions every other week or so so we would get a variety of market conditions and you can see me do my actual analysis so that does take a little time, and as you'll see in a few minutes, it does take a little deliberate practice. 
And where I'm going with all this is when you see a textbook sort of setup that just looks perfect, you're sort of forced to take it. Yeah, hold up on your stock picks until we get the live charts, just so I could see the other questions in there, and that's for your benefit. So if we go back to the beginning of September, right around when the market peaked, you could see we had seven longs and zero shorts, and then we got knocked out of a couple of longs, and then we got knocked out of a couple more longs, and then we put on a long. Dave, why would you put a long? The market's selling off. Well, if you back this chart way out, so far, this is just kind of a pullback in here. And I think it was a 30-day EMA. And we'll take a look at that when we get the live charts. And then now we have three longs and one short in the portfolio. Okay. Let me see if we can answer these questions before I shift gears. Good day from Oz. Good day to you, Laurent. Is the indicator Landry Light available on TradingView? No. But why don't you email the good folks over there and say, hey, this Dave Landry guy's got this Landry Light indicator, and I think it's pretty cool. So could you guys add that? Just make sure they put my name on it. That's a, my wife's been bugging me for years since she met Bollinger. She's like, who's this guy? I was like, John Bollinger. What's his deal? He invented Bollinger bands. They're like everywhere. You should put your name on something. Okay, baby, I will. Can you talk about the best time frame on intraday trading? I find the one minute scalp very low reward risk win rate. Five minutes seems to retrace the 2030 EMA on a trend day. What about a slower time frame? Okay. Um, you know what, Lauren? When we get to the live charts, in fact, I've got one chart in here. We could we could certainly discuss on that. I would I would encourage you to be careful with the day trading because it can kind of suck you in a little bit. But I do like the way you're thinking, kind of like the pullbacks to the EMAs and things like that. And that way, you're not getting a whole lot of whipsaw and you're not scalping like a madman. All right, on my website. Occasionally, there's a banner ad with me saying that if I can wave a magic wand and solve one of your trading problems, what would it be? And I went in and looked at the ones that I've taken care of, and I haven't I haven't finished going through, so I'm not sure how many of these I answered, how many that I haven't. But I've answered quite a, quite a few of them. And the one thing that comes to mind is. In these four courses down here, I would say probably 95% of the problems or the questions were answered. And as I've said before, it took me about a year and a half to put together this learning management system, and I'm still building upon it now. And my goal is, just in case I get hit by a beer truck or a blood test comes in really bad. I had a blood test come in like two weeks ago, <laughs> and uh, you nerfed. Doctor tried to catch me all over the week. It's never good. It's never good when you get voicemails over the weekend from your doctor. You know, he was trying to find me, trap me down. And finally, the nurse found me on Monday. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Luckily, it was just a, <laughs> just a fluke. But uh, my father had similar blood work, and and he he was dead within three weeks. So it's like it was very serious for a while. But just in case I have some bad blood work, these courses down here, they're all. The thing about it is they're all interrelated. And when I was putting together this learning management system, one of the good practices that they tell you to do in the course on learning management is to group your subjects into three topics, mind, money, management, methodology. And I was like, oh, that's gonna be easy for me. But then I quickly realized that, wait a minute, some of the money management is is kind of a mental type of thing and some of the mental kind of stuff can really boil down to money management i'm going to flesh a few of those things out in just a few minutes as we go to solve these problems and some of it's a little bit of everything that you can't really unpack one from the other as i often say it's like a three-stranded card where the money management the mind and the methodology all kind of wrap together. And if you get better at one, you get better at all. And again, I would suggest going through these members courses. And I think everybody here tonight is a member, but it's it's cheap to be a member of DaveLander.com. 
And I think you get a lot of bang for your buck, especially the Facebook group, which is part of the membership, which I think is absolutely worth it. It's worth it for me. It's paid for it for me, at least. And I think given the conversations going back and forth between us, it has too. Now, the things that I did not cover well or were lacking from the learning management system became part of the Q&As. Now, I backed off on the Q&As this year just because a lot of the answers are coming out of the Facebook group, which is awesome. And as I've said before, by the time I get around to answering some of these things, a lot of you guys and girls chime in and give a, a, a an answer as good or better than I could have given. <laughs> so for that, I thank you. But the Q&A session, and I'm going to fire up the Q&As again, but a lot of the answers are found here. And if you go to the members dashboard on the website, and you'll see a little thing for Q&A. If you scroll down a little bit, you go to the archives, and that's how you get there. If anyone's having trouble navigating, let me know. You have to, you have to realize that I'm kind of intimately familiar with everything, so I know where I put everything. And it might not be quite as obvious to everyone else. So anyway, I had this little stupid little banner ad on my site, and I just thought it was kind of funny. Like and that's what the motivational speakers tell you, you know, if, if I can wave a magic wand and solve one of your problems. Well, when you think about that, it it does apply well to life. It's kind of like you're bummed out about something. It's like, well, can you fix that? You know, how could you fix that? It's like a lot of times things are fixable, right? So one of the problems to be solved was profit target, and that's from Cal Pesh. This is actually the setup coming into today. Notice this nice, nice, nice trend here, okay? And this one didn't trigger today, but I still think it's a fantastic looking stock. This is the, the little teaser type of thing I do over in the stock chart show. But you can see it's a really cool looking TKO. Now, here's the thing. If you could figure out your entry, and your protective stop, then you know what your initial profit target is going to be. The protective stop, there's plenty of modules where I talk about that, but you just need to ask yourself, number one, where would I be wrong in this trend trade, okay? And how much room do I have to give it to survive, let's say, a one week or so move, so it could move far enough to possibly hit that initial profit target. So where are you gonna be wrong and how much wiggle room do I have to give it to withstand the shorter term volatility? Now, I chose this example specifically because it's a textbook TKO. And with a textbook TKO, your entry is just above the high and your stop is just below the low. Well, that's pretty darn easy. So now we have a risk Define entry minus stop is risk, right? Well, if you take that risk and add it to your entry, then bam, you automatically have your initial profit target. So in the spreadsheet, if you go back to the members dashboard and you click on members resources, I have given you or I have made available for you uh, the exact spreadsheet that I use. Now it's going to be dated and it's not going to have obviously current data in it, but what just go in, replace the symbols and the numbers and all, and you can use that as your tracking spreadsheet from now on. Anyway, when you put in your entry to stop, it automatically calculates your initial profit target. So that takes the guesswork out of it. One of the hardest things to do is figure out where your stop should go. For me, it's pretty easy because I've been doing this for a long time. I just kind of eyeball a chart and I try to be a little bit liberal. It's like, okay, what's the tightest stop I could ever possibly use? And then let's be a little bit more liberal than that. And you can't use a fixed small stop. You have to, tight stops, believe it or not, cause more losses than, than nearly anything other than uh, picking mediocre stocks, you know? Because you're going to get stopped out on noise alone. So you have to be outside the normal noise of the market. But again, a textbook TKO, pretty darn simple pattern to trade. Entry above the high, plus a little bit of wiggle, wiggle room, stop below the low. So again, if you know your entry and stop, you've got your risk figured out, and now you have your initial profit target. And by the way, if you punch those numbers in the spreadsheet, what will happen is 
it'll also calculate your share size based on a 2% risk. And you can adjust that down if you want to risk a little bit less. So where's the next profit target? Well, the next profit target, once you hit that initial profit target, okay, you're going to bring that stop to break even. You're going to exit half of your shares, right? Go through the money management module. It's all there. And then you're going to trail that stop higher for hopefully a long, long, long time. Charlie Kirk calls that free rolling. When he saw my money management, he says, I like the way you got that free rolling plan. And that's what we talked about last week or so, how to establish free positions. Well, garbage in, garbage out, as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And then uh, when it hits that initial profit target, get that stop up to break even. Okay, you might trail a little higher before, although I'm a little bit more liberal and not trailing as much for a one for one basis. And as painful as it might be, go in and watch those service archives and you'll see a lot of times the stock will go up a little bit even before the initial profit target is hit. And that's why I talk about the one for one trailing stop. And you'll see that I don't actually bump it up a little bit when that occurs. And that'll give you a feel for things watching me go through it. Not that I'm the ground poobah or anything. So let's take a look at a real example. This is LAC, pull back nicely in here. That's a good looking setup. If I see this same looking setup tomorrow, I'm gonna go after it, I'm gonna be all over it. In fact, look back here, you know, I think this was a 30-day uh, EMA. I watched a presentation a little while ago and the guy was full of ums and you knows. And that's something that I thought I had grown out of and i'm thinking i should write this guy a letter you know it's like i don't want to be like that guy but 10 years from now <laughs> he would thank me but anyway so now it's god's punishing me so i've got some uhs and you knows tonight anyway entry here and a stop down here and initial profit target up here and it didn't do a whole lot at first but then it began to rally banged out the initial profit target and we began trailing that stop higher and as you can see right there since that Initial profit target was banged out. We're at break even. And what we're going to do from there on is begin to trail a little bit more loosely. So stock begins to take off. And we trail a stop higher, but not quite on a one for one basis. And I really thought at this point in time, we were off to the races. And then unfortunately, the stock implodes and knocks us out. Well, better to love and loss lose, I guess you would say, some open profits than not to love at all. In other words, better to make a little money on a trade, in this case, 1% plus, plus a tiny bit on the remainder than to not make any money at all. And as I've said quite often, if you can establish enough free positions, sooner or later, you'll own the world. Because sooner or later, one or two of those or maybe a few more free positions will actually take off. Now, somebody said getting out at 40% profit instead of waiting to see 80%. Well, Chewy is a real good example because this was a buy a while back and it really didn't do a whole lot right away, but then we were able to get that initial profit target out. We brought our stop up to break even. Okay, so now we got a free position, and then what happened? Well, it just traded sideways, and this was a really good dead money example. In fact, some of the problems that were submitted in, which I'm not covering tonight, were like, well, what do you do when a stock just goes sideways right after you get in it? Nothing, okay? If you're stopped out, you're stopped out. If you're not stopped out in a case like this, then just hold tight, sit back, and relax. I know, ha ha. But when this happens, people give up and it's dead money. And I'd be willing to bet a lot of people gave up on this trade before it did this. Now, it did seem like it was off to the races for a while. We trailed that stop up higher accordingly, but unfortunately, it came back in and stopped out. So the gentleman was asking, he's getting out at 40% and he's watching it go 80%. Well, the simple thing there is just use a trailing stop and let that stop widen out over time to adjust the longer term volatility of the market. OK, that's the secret is we go in for that swing trade, right, with that swing trade stop like this. And then we let that slowly widen out. We never move it away from price. We just don't move it 
as fast as price moves higher, okay, when blessed with the move. And there's a few little tricks and tips you could use. And that's, again, it's all in the money management, not the soft sell you on that. Most, everybody here tonight has access. So go in and watch that for a little, some ideas on how to trail that stop. But that's the secret sauce. And that's how you squeeze out 80% instead of 40% on a trade, of course, that's going much more than 80%. Now, remember, in the end, it kind of sucks, right? You give up a lot of open profits. Well, like the hokey pokey, that's what trend following is all about. You never know whether that sell-off is a start of something bigger. All right, next problem, when to sell. That's an easy one. You sell when your stop is hit. So let's break that down. And oh, next question is kind of related, sorry. Exiting or not exiting, my downfall is expecting more from winners and riding them to zero. So in answer to the first problem, if your stop is hit, then there's two things to do. If it's hit, then you exit the trade. If it's not hit, then you don't exit. I know, I'm making it look easy, right? Well, it's not easy when you're sitting there watching that stock go against you day after day after day. You're thinking, well, let me just get out. Only a fool would stick with this stock. Well, take a look at that Chewy trade. It took forever for us to make some de decent profits on it, but in the end, it worked out. Not all the time, not every time, but longer term, if you can catch a few of those big outliers, you're going to do just fine. Now, getting back to the expecting, he's expecting the stock to do something, okay? Have no expectations. I was I was invited to go to Russia, and then uh, I, I pulled in a friend of mine who was Russian, and said, hey, if uh, if I can get you in on this gig, will you want to go with me? And he's like, yeah, sure, you know. Yes, yeah, sure, I will go. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then he ended up getting a gig in the meantime, and then the first gig kind of fell through, and he says, well, why don't you come with me? It's like, all right, fine. So I, I got on his gig, speaking at the Forex convention. Anyway, long story endless, we were walking around Red Square. Is that what they call that, Red Square? And he's like, when I put on a trade, I have no expectations. And I was, I, I heard what he said. I'm messing with him. I'm like, you have low expectations? He said, no, I have no expectations. Pay attention. And he's got a good point. It's like he, he's okay with the outcome. He's already accepted a mediocre outcome to begin with. And that's not saying have no expectations, okay? What you need to do is you need to pick the best stock going in, right? And once you're in, then let's say it moves in your favor, instead of expecting it to keep moving in your favor, just have that stop in place, that trailing stop in place. And if you must expect something like, okay, well, I'm up 10 points if my stop is hit, okay, I got a 500 shares on or whatever, then I'll make, what's that, 10 times 500, $5,000 on a trade. So that's mentally monetizing. If you're gonna mentally monetize, mentally monetize, down to your trailing stop. Try not to expect anything out of a trade. So what I recommend you do is hope for the best, but brace for the worst. I've done a whole presentation, and I think it probably came from the genesis of it. It was probably Brett Steenbarger, where he talked about you should be hoping when you're fearing and fearing when you're hoping. Either either Brett Steenbarger or it might have gone all the way back to like live in war. And a lot of traders, the stock starts going against them and they're stopped. They, they should have been stopped out, right? Because it, the, the trade is reversed on them and they're hoping that it comes back. And they should do just the opposite. They should hope for the best but then brace for the, for the worst. Oh, I know what it was. It was hoping when you should fear and fearing when you should hope. And I did a whole presentation just on that. I thought it was pretty good if I say so myself. Now, the other thing, because he was expecting this, and it kind of got me thinking about this behavioral science thing called the endowment effect. And recently, I did a lot of presentations on Darvis, 
And I'm not completely down with that yet. And I'll probably revisit him quite a bit here and there. I do have quite a few more things I want to talk about, mostly the wisdom of Darvis, not so much in the methodology in and of itself, but sort of his trader's journey like we talked about last time. Anyway, he's talked about treating certain stocks as his little pets and kind of like he, he liked them and, and he just thought of them as little pets and, um, you know, kind of no pun intended. It's kind of like Chewy was like that for me a while. It's like, ah, I'm a little... My little pet stock, so to speak. I'm happy to have this little stock. And and after it went through its little sideways move, it just started going up and up and up and up. And I was like, this is a great little stock. And I really, really became attached to that stock. Okay. Well, that's known an endowment effect. The longer you own something, the more you think it's going to be worth. I have a car I've been working on for 12 years. I think it's worth a lot more than what it's worth on Saturday, thanks to a little nudging from the little lady. <laughs> I'll be getting rid of that car for about a third of what I think it should, it's worth. But anyway, I digress. The bottom line is don't treat your stock like your child or your pet, okay? Or instead, I should say, treat them more like an employee. And I've done presentations on this. If you have an employee that's not doing anything, get rid of him, okay? Well, if you have a stock that's past your stop, not performing, and you have to get rid of it. It doesn't matter whether you owned it for a minute, an hour, a day, or a year. I don't have any problem in my trading and have an average return of 65% per year. Can you solve it? Okay. Well, I have questions. And I emailed this gentleman and I have yet to reply. He's yet to reply. So, I find it somewhat dubious, and my questions are, how many years, okay? He said, per year, is that every year? How many years? That's the first question. Next question is, how big is your account? I've been up close and personal with a few people recently, and you know, they whip out their phone, and hey, I started with 1,000 bucks, and look, I'm up $1,600, and a lot of them are now blown up, but that's a, another conversation. But if he started with 1,000, and is at 1650, then okay, well, good for you. But that's not the same as taking a 100K account to 165K or a million dollar account to a million 650, right? So that's the first question I would ask. Next question is what's your methodology? Okay. If you're selling, calls and puts selling options that is that'll work until it don't i had a client somewhat recently when the market was going straight up day after day after day he said dave i'm gonna take a break from your methodology i don't I'm not gonna renew my trading service because i'm selling these puts and it's doing really well i'm doing really well selling puts i'm like oh geez you know that'll work and to it don't and by the way if you have i think the word maybe asymmetrical might be the correct word but if you have asymmetrical risk, in other words, your reward is this big and your risk is, is this big, then sooner or later this big is going to happen. Let's see if I can grab it real quick. So I keep this little, um, I think it's Jan Dix. I keep this little greeting card on my desk right underneath my trading monitor, a little black swan, uh, Nicholas Tlaib made popular or popularized whatever the, the the concept of the black swan just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean they exist Lauren, you're down under that's where black swans come from have you seen an actual black swan the crazy thing is is i lived in the country and after i read to lee's book black swans I, I i kid you not started showing up in my pond and i have pictures of them i, I do it's the craziest thing and i'll when I edit this video, I'll throw the picture in here just to show you. But what's your methodology? You know, you can make a lot of small, small gains and do really well percentage-wise and consistently and accuracy-wise and then blow up. So I'd like to know what his methodology is. Can I solve it? Well, no, but I can make it better or save him from ruin. I have yet to find someone who's trend following 
that I can't make better with not everything that I do, but maybe like a little tweak to what they're doing. Like I've said before quite a bit, I was on a project with some brainiacs and uh, one of the guys was like, well, it's really cool what Dave's doing with that money management system. And I had few people, I've had a few people over the years comment on that. And that's like, I thought like it's Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. I thought everybody knew that, but maybe everybody doesn't. So I'm not being, I'm not being egotistical by saying I can make it better, but I'd be willing to bet I can make it better if he's trend following. So until we get a reply from him, we have no idea what he's doing. Well, good for him though. Now, next problem, money management and impulsivity while trading. I've never heard that word. So that's, I learn something new every day. Well, sometimes the solution is pretty damn simple. And that's just putting in a hard stop, okay? And the other thing you could do, especially if you're trading a, a thin issue, and I've been, I've gotten, there's two or three lately, and I just, oh, it's so mad when I think about it, that have ran up and passed my initial profit target on a spike, like during the middle of the day, and then come right back in. So I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but there are times where you might want to use a limit order, especially if you're trading a thin type of stock, an IPO or something that's kind of spiky, so to speak. Like you come in, it's up six points and you go have lunch, you come back in and it's down two points. <laughs> Laugh to keep them crying. So you could use hoard stops. And if you're a little bit newer to trading or if you're not really disciplined, because I like to do, I do like to apply a little discretion to try to squeeze a little bit more profits out of trades, to try to possibly stick with a stop nick and those other things that I talk about, like opening gap reversals to stick with a trade. But if you're a little bit less disciplined or a little newer to trading, then use that hard stop and let the market take you out. There's a psychology in letting the market make the decision for you. I had a stop in earlier on S&P futures and I got taken out. Yeah, I dropped an F-bomb, but it's a lot better than me sitting there watching that screen and then pulling that stop and say, well, let's just see if it goes a little further and, and do all that kind of thing and before you know it a leveraged position like that can get away from you but getting back to the gentleman's problem it might be as simple as using hard stops and limit orders for taking partial profits and the other thing too is it's cliche but plan your trade and trade your plan and your life will get a lot easier once you do that and when you plan that trade make sure you really really have what you think is the best of the best. And I spend a couple of hours every night, give or take, working on the trading service and going through those 2000 stocks and trying to find what I think is the best of the best stock. And then by making it get public, it forces me to A, garbage in, garbage out, put the best thing out there that I could find, not that of the grand poobah or anything. And B, it forces me to follow the plan. It's like, I don't, I'm not gonna say I don't have any stress. I'm not gonna say I don't, drop f bombs but with the stocks that i recommend in the trading service it's kind of a no brain i got a text from one of my clients a little while ago and he wanted to know what stocks i was still in and i said well i i think i got this and that and and you know just look at the service spreadsheet and if it stopped out recently then chances are that I stopped out too, because I follow that fairly close. And, and again, it's not stress-free, it's not easy, super easy or whatever, but it's a lot easier than some of the positions I'm taking on my own, where I'm like, oh, I didn't really make a full plan on how I'm gonna manage this. As long as it's going your way, it's no problem, right? <laughs> it's when things begin to go against you. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, said Mike Tyson or his manager. All right, plenty of things coming in. There are plenty of black swans in Melbourne where Barry lives. Barry's our other represent, representative from down under, Lauren and Barry. Okay, we'll get to that in one second. Okay. Click on the X on slow network. Okay, slow down. Okay. 
Yeah, sometimes the obviously between me and near New Orleans and Australia, there's a lot of things that can happen. A couple of random thoughts I want to go through, and then if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks or any other questions that haven't been answered yet, feel free to do so. One of the things that I've come up with that that's kind of an epiphany for me and this is through dealing with people over the years and I forget the exact number so don't quote me on this and I know I'll probably say a different number every time but I think it's it's in the six figures hundreds of thousands of emails and I know I have 30,000 unanswered emails right now <laughs> so if you haven't gotten the answer lately you're in the queue okay I promise and, and lately I've been trying to systematize that a little bit so they get into the queue and, and I take care of them. But anyway, through that interaction, a lot of times somebody will say, look, I'm having some issues. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm like, well, how am I gonna figure out what they're doing wrong? And I'll ask, well, what are you doing wrong? And then they tell me, I'm not honoring my stops. Like, well, honor your stops. <laughs> you know, my work is done, drop the mic. I don't drop the mic anymore because I broke too many of them. Anyway, the good news is you know what you're doing wrong. Like the doctor, doctor joke, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that, okay? I know, easier said than done. Garbage in, garbage out, as I've been saying earlier. And the way you get better is to practice deliberate practice. I've got a few articles on the website on that. What's his name? Malcolm Gladwell has talked a lot about that. And I forget the guy's name that a lot of his research sort of came from. And people think those two have a riff. Guy from Alabama. It escapes me. It's hard for me to remember these things when I'm live. Uh, you know the thing. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> anyway, uh, the way you get better is to keep practicing looking at stocks by looking at stocks, but make sure you're trying to get better at looking at stocks when you're doing it. Now, what you want, and I'm doing a, a little research on this lately, is not usually what is. And I'm reading a, a book from Denise Shaw and it kind of dovetails in with a lot of the work of, of Douglas. And it's also some of the presentations I've done in the past where I talk about markets and this is kind of borrowing from Douglas, but markets only exist in your head and the fear only exists in your head. I know it's like, really Dave? You know, Well, yeah, stick around my office like I say each week. You know, Mike here tonight, I got my little F-bomb, you know, because I dropped so many of them, he sent me one. <laughs> anyway, if you're not an active participant in the market, it's very easy to just kind of look at the market and say, oh, it's going up, it's going down, it's going sideways. But once you're in the market, it becomes what you want, okay? And what you want is usually not what is, and you have to kind of learn to live with that. And you do that, through sometimes something as simple as a hard stop, as I mentioned earlier. But deliberate practice, again, getting back to that, garbage in, garbage out. If you're picking better stocks, and this comes back to the methodology helps the money management, or, I'm sorry, methodology helps the mindset and the money management helps the methodology, and they all kind of, again, are intertwined. So if you're getting better at picking stocks, you're gonna have fewer losses, your mindset's gonna be a lot better, you're gonna to learn to recognize a better trade going in. And when you have a loss, you'll say, well, you know what, it happens. This was a good looking setup, just like that TKO I showed you a few minutes ago. I would take that same setup again in a heartbeat. So you gotta remember that the market in Douglas would be a little, he's a little esoteric the way he says it, but it makes a lot of sense. I don't have to go in and reread Douglas. But basically he says that market exists in your mind. Now, postmortems are key, not to be confused with the post Malone, which I think is the same guy that said, yeah, bomb, I have a post Malone shirt now. <laughs> anyway, like, look at that old fart wearing a post Malone shirt. Well, I like some of his stuff. But postmortem, not a post Malone, are key. And as I've said a thousand times, would you, would you sort of reach that epiphany of enlightenment or whatever whatever you want to call it. Yeah, let me get my tongue unstuck. You're gonna look at a stock after a trade or any other market for that matter. 
and say, what the hell was I thinking? And you shouldn't get mad at that point. You should feel good at that point because that means you realize that you did the wrong thing. I do not do enough postmortems. I am guilty. I don't like doing postmortems, okay? I'm not going to bother doing them on a winning trade, which I probably should, because in some cases, maybe that trade wasn't as great as I thought. And I don't want to do them alerting on a losing trade because they aggravate me. But I do occasionally break down and do them, especially when I'm in a drawdown. Now, the only problem I find is it adds insult to injury. It's like, why the hell did you do that? But it's painful and you have to do them. One thing I've been thinking about a lot, a lot lately is the pre-mortem, okay? So a pre-mortem can often save your buttocks. So sometimes, especially if you're watching too many flickering ticks, we're going to turn from David Keller. And I, I keep forgetting the guy's name, where he got it from. But anyway, if you're watching too many of those flickering ticks, you could likely get sucked into a trade. And one thing, and I'm guilty as anyone, but one thing that I do, like today, there's a couple times today, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I could get in this trade, I could only lose $400, and that's not too bad. And then, you know, if you do that every day, that's $100,000 a year, it begins to add up, okay? Even $100 a day on some kind of S&G type of trade, if you're not careful, that adds up to $25,000 a year. So what I did today specifically, especially since I'm working on these slides, it's like, okay, Dave, how are you gonna feel if you take this mediocre intraday trade and lose $400 within minutes or an hour, however long it takes? And it's like, you know, I'm not gonna to feel too good about that. And it's really gonna piss me off because I've broken all of my rules and all these other things that I'm trading because I can't lose much. Although again, it adds up as opposed to trading to make money. And that's the only reason why you should ever trade. But pre-mortems can often save your butt off. You can say, okay, well, I'm looking at this stock and I'm thinking about trading it tomorrow. You know, how would I feel if I took this trade and got stopped out? That textbook TKL can tell you right now, if I took that trade, or if I take that trade, I should say, and get stopped out, I could give a flip. I'll be like, you know, so what? You know, screw you, whatever, F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. And then I'll shout next. It, 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 I'll get over it quickly. But if I take some sort of mediocre trade and it goes against me, it's really going to upset me. So going back to like that L LCRX trade we just took that I just showed, that was a good looking textbook type of setup. And I think I might have jinxed everyone, but but it might work. I think BCLI was another one of those where I said, this is the greatest looking setup in setup town. It stops me out. I don't care. A crazy bitch. A crazy is, is doing what you shouldn't do and know you shouldn't do it dieting is a good example or makes for good examples of a crazy it's like oh you know it's like tonight I, i'm gonna resist and, and i think i'll be okay but you know i'm kind of parched right now my throat's a little scratchy from talking and and you know my house all dry it's like i'm gonna i want to go drink some beer it's like well what what harm is that gonna do if i just have a couple of beers it's like well you're you're kind of stealing from your future self. Well, I'll gain a few pounds. Tomorrow I'm going to be tired and maybe I'll miss some opportunities in the market or maybe I won't follow my plan or whatever because I'm too tired or hungover or whatever. So you kind of have to time travel a little bit with that acrasia, but that acrasia is, it's kind of like not doing what you should do when you should do it. And I've often talked about the micro versus the macro and that's life, you know? It's like, don't don't snap back at your spouse when things get a little bumpy or whatever, you know, just kind of think through it a little bit, take a deep breath. Sometimes you just have to, Dakota saying, mm, beer. I know. Now, why did I say beer? Damn it. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to take a step back and give yourself a few minutes to calm down. If you find yourself getting too emotional trading, sometimes just counting to three. Sometimes that pre-mortem, like today, a couple little intraday opportunities, at least perceived opportunities, I thought, you know, I'm gonna take this trade, I'm just gonna jump in because I, I can only lose $400. Well, again, that $400 adds up. So how am I gonna feel, okay, time traveling an hour ahead in time when that thing stops out? And you can also say, how am I gonna feel if it takes off without me? And that's the hard part, is learning how to say, well, it took off without me, but eh, 
it just didn't seem like the risk were worth it. Today, on the long side, I didn't take any long side trades in the S&P futures. I just felt like it wasn't worth it. So acrasia can be a bitch. And one way around acrasia, okay, doing what you should not do, even though you know you should not do it, it's kind of reminiscent, reminiscent of Paul from, I guess it's Romans or something. I know not to what to, I know not what to do, but I do it anyway. And the only reason I know that, although I have read some Bible before, which is kind of scary because the end of the world is near because of all the things happening this year. Plus, there's peace in the Middle East because <laughs> you know it used to be all this fighting in the Middle East. I'm like, well, at least the end of the world's not here, and like now there's peace in the Middle East. Like, oh crap. Anyway, I digress. You need to commit to commitment devices because, like Paul. You you know most of the time what you're doing wrong, but you do it anyway, and that's what acrasia is. Now, a commitment device like Ulysses is like, okay, I, I want to hear these sirens song, so you guys got to put some wax in your ears, and I want you to tie me to the mast, and if I say, let me go, let me go, <laughs> don't let me go. Uh, an example I've given a thousand times is, is a buddy of mine, like many of us sitting or standing around all these monitors, was getting a little pudgy as a trader. He's a pretty good trader, by the way, but that's irrelevant to the story. Anyway, he found a young kid that was fit and liked to work out and I guess had less money because he was much younger and all. And said, look, here's the deal. I'll pay you gym membership. I'll pay you gas. You're going to give me a ride to the gym every morning. If I'm not sitting on this swing on my front porch at 6 a.m. sharp, I'm going to give you $20 every day. And that's a commitment device. I I was thinking when I was putting these slides together, there's a um, back when I was in the gym before this whole COVID crap started, and I was really enjoying the gym. There's a trainer there I became really good friend, friends with. And I was thinking a little while ago, it's like, you know, to get back in shape, I could hire this guy and not only would I be paying this guy and, and hate, you know, to not go if I was paying him, but I could tell him, look, if I miss an appointment, I'll give you 50 bucks. And that one little thing right there would be a commitment device, I know, to get me back in the gym. Well, you know, my excuse is a little paranoid about this COVID thing, but, and that is a valid excuse, I think, but eventually that's going to go away. And so I'll need some commitment advice. One example of someone recently is I don't know if um I don't know I, I think he's since circumvented his own commitment device, but I have a doctor client who's also a good friend, and we talk a lot about trading together. I get a lot of my material from it. it's awesome. <laughs> I should pay him instead of him paying me. I hope he's not watching tonight. Anyway, he he's a good scalper. He's a really good scalper. I I tried to kind of follow him a little bit. I tried to do it on my own and I failed miserably. And I would recommend you don't try to scalp. I know there's a question here from Lauren about scalping. We'll get to that in one second. But he'll go in and, and his sweet spot's the first 30 to 45 minutes every day. And so what he'll do is after 30, 45 minutes, he's done. He'll actually hand his phone over to his secretary and say, can you change my password to my trading account? She goes in, she changes the password to the trading account and hands it back over to him. And he has to have a phone on him so he can't just leave with the secretary. Sometimes though, he, he tells me he'll purposely leave it in his car when he can when he has to go in and to be without a phone for a little while, not to trade. So figure out what your commitment device is today. Well, yesterday would be a, a, a much better example. I got short S&P futures and I didn't want to micromanage myself out of the position. And I knew if I was sitting there watching the market drop, I'd say, you know what, that's enough. Let me just take my money and run. So what I did was, instead of sitting there watching a stupid screen of slickering ticks, I had an automated trailing stop in. So I did have a stop in place. I went in the house and had lunch. And when I came back, not all the time, but this particular time, the market had moved greatly in my favor. Had I sat there and watched those ticks, I would have just been really tempted. And I, knowing myself, I probably would have taken those profits. So a lot of times, I forced myself not to watch the screen. Today, I didn't want to get sucked into any stupid little S&P future trades or whatever. So I spent most of my day working on these slides that you're seeing now. And I tried not to walk over my trading monitor and fire off a bunch of trades, unnecessary trades, that is. 
Uh, this is from this morning. I pulled this, but it's still relevant. This is the volatility chart. Down here we have multiple volatilities. We went through this quite a bit. As I said in that presentation, volatility can be a rabbit hole and look like a holy grail. As you can see, it kind of peaked out nicely right at the market bottom. But it doesn't line up quite as beautiful as it looks here, but it is something that you want to pay attention. And obviously, with this recent little slide we've had in here, volatility has begun to pick up. So we're gonna we need to pick up, uh, we need to pay attention on that and see where it takes us. Now, the other thing I want to show you is we did have what I call a holy grail day yesterday. And I've gone through all these little illustrators if you want to call them that. But this right here is the day since you've had a holy grail. When it gets really, really high, you know you're you're due for one. And a holy grail day, it starts at one end and ends at the other. These are just absolutely excellent days. It doesn't always have to end at the other, but it just doesn't need to get within 10% of the high of the day. So if you short it at some point in time on a holy grail day, that's the secret to trading. If we could figure out when these holy day, grail days will occur. But I just wanna show you this chart and go in, what I would urge you to do, especially now the market volatility is increasing, it will compress again, and then we look for that next expansion. But without going into a lot of detail tonight about all this stuff, I'd go in and watch the volatility presentations that I did, especially now that the market's getting a little bit uh, questionable. White Claw is key, two carbs, White Claw. Is that any good? I saw a lot of um, a lot of Karens drink white coffee. <laughs> mm, beer says the Dakota. The I oh, gotta bring it up again. <laughs> okay, lots and lots of questions. Hi Dave, maybe too broad of a question for here. Better in Facebook, but here it goes. Standard pullback entries above high of pivot doesn't seem to be working for me inversely for shorting cdns is an example well first of all it always seems like shorts go against you and that's actually a market adage all shorts go against you and boy it sure does seem like that short side is is tricky okay it looks it looks easy on paper but in reality it's not uh i dropped more f-bombs on the short side i promise you the long side the long side is just a lot more cleaner and I don't know why that is. I guess you still have a lot of people that are fighting the market, buying that dip, thinking that more than a dip. Now, I'm not talking about a pullback dip. I'm talking about like a bow tie or something where the market has rolled over. Okay, and alongside momentum generally continues above the entry. That is correct. On the short side, resistance seems to be stronger and the stock bounces right off the entry. I've had this happen a high percent of the time. Anything. Anything to this observation? Your observation is 100% correct. And do you handle the short entries differently at all? No, not really. Um, you know, the, ideally on the short side, you have something like one little bar up after a big drop and then the market implodes from there. I'm not as excited about stocks, like even though I do have some puts in ATVI, full disclosure, but like ATVI, it, it, it sort of, kind of triggered then it just kind of or actually before it triggered it sort of bounced around a little bit and didn't implode if a short you have a one little bar up and then all of a sudden it goes straight back down you get so many people caught on the wrong side of the market that you don't get that that little observation that you see so maybe try to trade short side setups pioneer setups not pioneer setups well pioneer setups and transitional setups, emerging trend setups, only off of all-time highs and individual issues, and ideally with just that one bar up. And if we have any examples, I will uh, be happy to show them. But yeah, that's definitely fodder for a lot more conversation. John says, you had mentioned that you have different trading accounts other than the service portfolio. Do you use variations in methodology? In different accounts? No, not really. Uh, but you know, I have like an IRA account where I can't do outright shorting. So I'll do deep in the money puts there, okay? I've often thought about doing um, like kind of, if you can't beat them, join them, you know, a little bit of this ETF type of trend following moron stuff. But old habits die hard. I, I tend to, I just like the, I like the momentum game. I like trading individual stocks. 
as the gentleman earlier, Avi was asking, do I have other strategies when the market gets iffy like this? No, I short. I, I will occasionally, I try not to do it every day. I try to do it all day, but I will occasionally trade some S&P futures. It's a very efficient market. It's a very tough way to trade. And I, I, I probably couldn't teach you how to trade it just because it's so inefficient other than waiting for these holy grail days to be near waiting for this like little peak to happen something like this and then look for a big move lower or higher whatever the case may be afterwards maybe looking for a compression in volatility but yeah for the most part i kind of do the same thing i have a forex account i kind of do the same thing there and you know maybe some slight variations what i used to do with forex is is try to catch like hourly turns off like weekly charts and all but i haven't done a whole lot of that lately in my cryptocurrency accounts i'm doing kind of the same trend following moron type of stuff and we could take a look at that if you guys remind me when we get to the live charts so lauren asked about the best time frames well i do have a chart here i want to show you that might help flesh that out a little bit so this is a 60 minutes spiders chart and we often talk about patterns being fractal. I'm often asked about patterns being fractal. And that just means what occurs in one time frame occurs in others. And you can see we had a bow tie on the 60 minute chart. And here's the thing, and I know Jim Freeman, I think he's, I don't know if he's in here tonight or not, but he does a lot of this type of analysis and he pays careful attention to the hourly charts. Now, the market's going to turn, a bear market's going to start an hourly chart, okay? But not every hourly signal will turn into a bear market. And that's the thing. Sometimes it might just be a pullback on the daily. But I do want to get a, get kind of ahead of it and show you ahead of this thing and show you what happened on the hourly. And since this turn, this bow tie, you see the, the Landry light with a 30 EMA has been mostly red ever since we had that one little day where it got above it was green for a little while and then we went back to being red had a little kiss okay and then we'll have to take a look at it again okay down here's a proper order of moving averages you see the bow ties turned down here okay and they've been in mostly proper order for most of the time we had one little blip up here but then it turned right back down okay so that's what an hourly looks like um getting back to lawrence question you might would think about take a look at like a five minute chart or a 10 minute chart and then maybe keep an hourly chart in mind and say okay the hourly is negative and i'm looking for possible signals let's say in a five minute 10 minute whatever time frame you want to use don't use a one minute chart way too noisy and say look i'm going to wait till we have some landry light to the downside let's just say 10 bars or so okay and then I'm gonna play those pullbacks along the way. And we'll take a look at a live um, or live as of today, five minute chart in just one second. Okay, so uh, if you are not a gold member of Dave Landry, why not? It's cheap and you're gonna learn a lot and you'll be part of the Facebook group where you can interact with other traders. And we've got some really good traders in that group. You do have to be a gold member of davelandry.com, which is the lowest level of a paid subscription. And that just to keep that just keeps the riffraff out. I know I joke about that, but as I've said a thousand times, I've been involved with a lot of forums and some of them professional forums where people should I don't know why they behave the way they behave, but uh, they all become Lord of the Flies. And this knock on wood has been the best forum. I know it's mine, so it's I'm I'm biased. But when I started this group, I'm like, oh God, here we go again. This is probably a bad idea. But the course I took on how to create an educational learning management system suggested to make a group and that way you can interact with your people and not just like oh here's the course go take the course and you could actually get in front of it and answer questions and all and to my surprise it's been just absolutely awesome all right let me shift gears let me answer a couple of questions in the process could you show an option trade and ts for the short sales I don't have that on this computer, but I know you and I were talking offline about that. So I could just kind of give you an idea. Let me just 
you and I were talking about the, I think it was CDNS, and I had to wait for it to actual, tr actually trigger in the service before I went in after it. And I'm trying to remember which day that trigger was. Let's see, it was on, I guess it was, I forget which day it was, but it was trading around 100. And the options were kind of expensive at the money. So I actually went 15 points in the money, okay? And I was able to get them for right around 15 or maybe 15 and change. So that's going to have obviously a delta of 100. It's going to trade like 100 shares. So like today, this damn stock, pardon my French, a little French friend, you should say, date, that sounds like English. It's up two and a half points. So I lost 250 bucks an option on this trade. Plus I am short a few shares. So it, it, it hurt, okay? It hurt pretty bad. But that's a substitution for stock. So as I was saying, you're putting up like $15,000 per 100 shares, as opposed to putting up 20, I'm sorry, you're putting up $1,500 per 100 shares, as opposed to putting up $10,000 per 100 shares. So tomorrow, this company gets bought out and goes to 200, I'm out 1,500 bucks. Well, I'll live per contract, I'll live to fight another day. If I'm short, which I am <laughs> short a few shares, if I'm short and it goes to 200, then I'm in a lot of trouble. Okay, so that's the advantage of options. It's a can of worms. I don't really want to get into it tonight, but what I would recommend you do, Barry, is go in and watch. There's plenty of options talk behind the firewall in the Q and A specifically. So if you could go in and and watch a lot of that. I think you'll get an idea. Now, I did take an S and G trade and kind of violation of my rules, like what harm could it do? I did buy some short dated options and I paid about a point premium for an at the money put. And I think about uh, 81s on ATVI. Now with options, you kind of have to anticipate, just like on the short side, you kind of have to anticipate the trade. It's kind of like one step above that. You kind of have to anticipate the rollover. If you wait for the rollover, then it's sometimes it's too late, okay? Getting back to the CODIS question, like say this second day up here, because it was meaningful. This one's not quite enough, but this day up here made a higher, high, higher low. If it would have triggered like right after that and sold off fairly hard, let's say down to 74 or so, then you've got a whole mess of people trapped on the wrong side of the market. Think about the psychology of people involved. If it fakes out an entry, let's say your entry is way up here, and then, it's, then it climbs up a little bit, then people might be cautious, but as long as it doesn't implode, they might say, well, this thing's still okay. I'm not gonna bail on my shares. And then some other people might think, well, look, it's still on sale. I might go ahead and pick up some of this. And before you know it, shorts get squeezed out, and then you're hurt and pop. So all shorts, tend to go against you. Let me, before I forget, let's take a look at the overall market real quick. And if we have time, we'll eventually get to the, we'll look at some intraday stuff on the ACP plug. And before we do that, let's just take a look at the overall market. A lot of areas are bow tying down. In fact, let's take a look at the P's first. The S&P 500 officially have bow tied down as of today. And as long as we stay below these moving averages, they will continue to be in bow tie formation. Technically, for this to be a sell signal, we'd have to have a little bit of a bounce, a one bar bounce. Obviously, back here, textbook type of bow tie, perfect crossing. Here's a little bit sloppy. Okay, I'm not going to pick apart this versus that and say this is not going to kill us. Okay, because it might. But this one back here just seemed kind of textbook. Started off with a gap down. It really imploded. This looked like the market was in a lot of trouble. Like the gentleman, I think it was Avi, pointed out earlier, market beginning to look a little iffy, and he, he is correct, okay? Uh, like uh, Ed McMahon used to say, right you are. I would keep an eye on today's low. And if we that gets taken out with vigor, I would begin to get a little concerned. If we look at a market longer term, I think we are still in okay shape. And I wanted to show you this tonight. It's just not enough time. 
But on a weekly chart, you can see we just got to pull back in here. Now, it's a bit of a bummer that we did pull back below the prior peak. I'm not going to say the double top word just yet. But on a weekly basis, we're still okay. But any additional weakness, especially if we got below the 50-week moving average, would be of some concern. NASDAQ looks a lot better on a weekly basis because we never did get back below this peak. So that's very encouraging going back to a daily chart. Bow ties have rolled over, okay? We did find a little support about 10.5, so that's your inflection point. And 11.5 round number is going to be your top inflection point. As long as we bounce between those levels, let's not get too excited one way or the other. But if we take out 10.5, then obviously we might need to seriously reconsider any possible new, sh new longs, consider some more new shorts, and of course, honor our stops on the long side. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty 2000 has good and bow tied, although it was kind of sloppy, but it's still a bow tie. Nonetheless, it's broken down on this trading range, so that's a bit of a bummer. Obviously, gold, the commodity, has rolled over, as you can see. A few big updates, of course, would make all the difference in the world. A few big updates for a lot of these sectors, like drugs and biotech, et cetera, would make a big difference, okay? And you can see that the 10 is starting to push higher, but then you can see the price is actually kind of dropping in here. So if price stays here, it, this 10 will eventually roll back over like everything else. Health services, bit of a bummer, okay? They tried to break out, came right back in, no big whoop, but then they broke down out of their range, so that's of some concern. Longer term, retail looks fine over the short -ter term. You can see it's beginning to roll over a little bit in here. Some of uh, ignore that, that's bad data. Uh, computer software, you can see longer term, just kind of pulling back, but if it takes out these recent lows in here, that would be of some concern, obviously. It hasn't actually officially bow tied down just yet. So I would keep an eye on the bow ties in here. I take a look at silver, for instance. It was kind of bullish in here for a while, pulled back to the 30, looked like it was off in races again, but nope, it rolled back over, as you can see. A little nice little hookup today in silver. That's one of those markets I'm like, ah, you should get in. And like, no, I'm not gonna fire off any unnecessary trades, too much going on. Okay, uh, the question is, Tesla, let's do this. Let me see if I can get the ACP charting up really quick. ACP. Oh, it's clickbait, man, that's crazy. That's what my mug says, clickbait. <laughs> What's his name, David Dorbick? I got a clickbait shirt from when I knew my daughter was coming home within like a week. And I got a clickbait shirt thinking that she'd be like, Dad, you're too old for that. And she actually got me a mug. Sometimes we, when her mother goes to bed, sometimes we watch his videos on the, on U, YouTube. It's pretty funny. Uh, let's see. Let me get this shared. What's his name? Dorbrick? I forget. I haven't seen it in a while. I'm not going to... I'm not gonna watch it without her. Uh, let's see. So you said Tesla, and the reason I want to bring it up here is because I use Tesla as an example of. Oh, that's what I wanted to show you. But I'll publish your chart on Facebook tomorrow. I wanted to show you how a a five day EMA would work with the Landry Light. So let's take a look at Tesla. The question is, is it still set up? Okay. Well, this was my example a while back of the Landry Light pullback. And I said, okay, we've got a nice little Landry Light pullback here. You can see you had some green, you got enough green, you want 10 bars of green. And so far it's come out of this pullback, but then it's come back in again. So I would leave it alone for now. This stock is getting kind of mature in here. And not that I listen to them, but a lot of naysayers are coming out of the woodwork. So, not that that matters, but I think that you know, remember how Apple had this allure to it and it could do no wrong. Well, I think I think that's starting to come off a little bit. The bloom is starting to come off the rose, so to speak. So I would hold off on Tesla. If you're long, have a stop in mind. It really shouldn't take out this low by much. Okay, so make sure you're willing to get out if it takes out this low. 
especially if it does so decisively. Click on the X on the slow network connection message, okay? All right, hey Barry, we got uh, down under representative, representative nice, Tcon, and we'll probably switch back over to the uh, TC because I can go a little quicker. Tcon I like, this one came up in my scans tonight, and the only reason I didn't put it as an official setup is I think it needs to pull back a little bit more, okay? But I like the way it's taken off in here. Look at your Landry light. A little bit, you know, the, the cool thing about using this little 30-day EMA lately is it sort of illustrates right about where my pullbacks would be, especially where I would like a market to pull back. Now, I eyeball this. I don't actually plot the 30 when I do this. But I'd be willing to bet that on most cases where I, I'd like a stock to pull back, would also be the 30 EMA, especially in these go-go stocks like this. So yeah, I like this one. It does have some longer term issues, I do believe. Let me switch back to my other charts where I'm a little bit easier or a little bit better at using them. So TCON, nice little pullback. Yeah, I don't like this gap way back here and all, but here's the thing, this market this year with these crazy stocks like this, I've been given I haven't been as crazy picky, okay? But yeah, Donald, good job on that one. Bought 10 shares of Peloton in April, stopped out last week for a 48-point win on five shares. <laughs> awesome. Gave up 22 points of profits, but who cares? Your methodology works. Looking for the next outlier. I'm new to your system and still learning. Yeah, that's key, David. You know, trade at a small size that's nearly meaningless. And, you know, that's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up because that's another thing I wanted to say. A lot of the psychological problems go away, okay, when you're trading at a, at a tiny size. It's like, eh, you lose, so what? Who cares? You know, you would spend more money going out to dinner, right? You don't get depressed the next day when you spend too much money on dinner. Well, sometimes you do, <laughs> especially if you get a little revenge happening, but that's another story altogether, which reminds me, we're having Mexican tonight. Uh, I digress too far. But yeah, you know, and that's the thing. And that's where you realize, you know, you got to get the reps in and you got to do it with as little emotion as possible. And I know a couple of you guys that are in tonight, one particular, I think, is trading at like a quarter percent or a half percent with the methodology. And I know you, you were wanting to step on the gas a little bit recently. And it's like, well, let's just bump it another quarter point. And then luckily he didn't jump to the full 2% per trade. And that was in early September. If he would have, he'd be hating life right now going through this little rollover drawdown until we can adjust to the new conditions with positions that could either trade contra to the overall market or on the short side, if the market does roll over, make a little money on the short side, okay? MICT, crazy high HV. It tagged 200 EMA today and bounced 30% intraday. MICT. Yeah, that's crazy. That's too crazy. That, to me, it looks like that's rolled over. What do they do? What do they, uh, they have electric powered missiles that shoot coronavirus or something? <laughs> trill, I think I like that one. And if I don't like it, I'll say the trill is gone. Yeah, I like this one. This gap's a little extreme for me, but I do like it. It's a little bit on extreme size. Usually when there's a huge gap like this, Stocks stop trading cleanly because everybody's jockeying for position, but it does look pretty good. Um, I think it's okay. I probably personally wouldn't take it just because of the size of the gap, but it, it looks good, okay? Silk, that's gonna be a crazy one, huh? We're running a little late, so we'll have to speed it up. Yeah, it looks okay. It needs a little bit more pullback. That's definitely in my momentum list for what it's worth. FCX is a short. That's going to be Freeport, MacMoron, and that's going to be trend filing more. No, not yet. No, that's still just a pullback. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush out and buy it. I don't like the gap here, but it is, a, it is a copper stock, so prone to gaps. I think so far your trends, your trends up here. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go long, but it looks good. It looks okay. I mean, nice uptrend. This is not a stock that's rolled over. Take a look at like CDNS, okay? 
Okay, notice that, and I've talked about this one quite a bit. Go in and watch the show to short or not to short on my home page page of the website for a little bit more on these rollovers. But notice that this thing lost steam for about two months. By the way, this looks still looks like a fantastic short. You know, your kids, they're probably pains in the butts, right? Just take the college funds, just uh, go 100% short in this, mortgage your house, you know, take your wife's jewelry, hock it, and just go 100% short in this. You know, someday somebody's going to take me out of context and I'm going to get in a shit ton of trouble. <laughs> Oops, I just demonetized my video. Damn it. DPHC. Yeah, I like it. In fact, uh, oops, that is a recommendation. Forget about that. <laughs> Look the other way. Um, yeah, I mean, this is really crazy. This is even crazy by Big Dave standards, but it's just such a massive run higher and a pullback. And it just looks like one of these crazy stocks lately that's just poised to, uh, to really take off. So, yeah, my apologies to my service peeps for letting that sneak out. I won't publish this until later tomorrow, and I think everybody here is on the service anyway, so I can't do it personally, but if you want to front run it, that's fine with me. Yeah, this one looks fantastic. I like this one a lot. It needs a tiny bit more pullback, but it looks good. We need to figure out what they do and why it's doing so well, because energy is not really doing that well right now, obviously. But yeah, this looks good. Just a tiny bit more pullback though. And that's probably why you're not seeing it on my list tonight. But yeah, good, good job, Donald. High five, especially pulls back a little bit more. IMVT. Yeah, this one looks okay. It could use a little bit more pullback. But yeah, it looks okay. And then, you know, what, what have I been saying tonight? The, well, it did pull back to the 30, but it didn't really have an extreme trend higher before pulling back. But I'm going to say that one looks okay. All right. I think there's a couple out there I like better. But yeah, that looks that looks good. That looks pretty good. Oh, the PEIX. That's crazy, crazy, crazy stock. Oh God, you gotta be kidding me. Oh, thank you, Dakota. Yeah, you're icing a kicker, man. CDNX is that big. So had I not been short and just had the puts, I wouldn't be uh... all right. So you guys start shorting it for me. <laughs> Get that get those college funds cashed in tonight. Yeah, this is just such a crazy, crazy, crazy one. It's gonna have to have a pretty deep pullback for uh for me to go after it, okay? But yeah, for sure, it's in my momentum list. Thanks, Dakota. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, this one I like. I gotta I need to look at my Landry list. Uh, Stuart, if you look at the Landry list, um, if it's on my Landry list, I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. It's got a nice deep pullback. A little bit on the extreme side, a little bit high HV, but yeah, a nice little deep pullback for sure. AMWL. Yeah, this is one that I thought about going after as an IPO. I kind of hate when they make their wide range on, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I hate when they make their wide range on day five. And then it shot to 30 and it came back in. So I decided to pass. And what I'm going to do in the case like this is, Possibly look for a deep retracement, okay? And go after it then. But yeah, definitely put that on your watch list. It's in my IPO watch list for sure. CTRA. Yeah, a little bit more pullback, obviously, on this one. It's a metals and mining company. Metals are a little iffy right now. This is also a little bit on the thin side, too. So keep an eye out on that. Let's back this chart way out, see what we got. Yeah, that looks that's kind of that looks fantastic longer term. That's kind of like a Phoenix type of stock. I like it a lot. Okay. I like to see a little bit more pullback, but man, that looks fantastic longer term. That looks like the mother of all bottoms. That looks pretty good. Well, W-E-L-L. -L. Yeah, this this could be a, a the mother of all shorts pretty soon, as you can see. Oh, it's not coming off all time highs. I just prefer shorts coming off all time highs. So I would pass on this one. There's too many stocks that are rolling over from all time highs right now, but I hear you. And I certainly can't fault you on that. I mean, the stock picking has become phenomenal in these shows. And I think that's because everybody here has been around for a while and, and paying attention or at least knows what I know what I like. Yeah, this looks okay. It's got some issues longer term, but not too bad. This is actually, if it's not in my Landry list, it will be because I was, Wanting a little bit more pullback, but I think it's uh I think it's in the Landry list tonight. 
I'm going to have to make a list of those. Yeah, we talked about that one. Make sure I don't uh, well, CMPS. Yeah, another IPO. Now, this one, what I would do here is I think I would wait for it to pull back. I'm a little bit more leery when they're above $20 a share and, and been a little leaning with that this year. But this one's at 40, so it's well above $20 a share. When they are above $20 a share, what I also like to do is add in a five-day, just a simple moving average, and look for Landry Light. How easy could it be, right? I mean, this will probably have it. No, it won't have it yet because we only have five days worth of trading. You might have to do that manual calculation. But yeah, in this case, let's let it pull back a little bit. Well, look, I'm way out of time. I appreciate you guys and girls being here tonight. Any unanswered questions, bring them up in the Facebook group. If you're a member, if you're watching on YouTube and you have questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Also like the video and all. And I will thank you very much. You're welcome, Carol. Thank you so much for being here tonight. All right, everyone. Everybody have a great weekend. If we'll talk between now and then, I'll see most of you people on Friday in Facebook. Thank you so much.